Hi YouTube, how's it going? It's Dan back with part four of Learn Audio DSP. Today we're going to be talking about lookup table oscillators, which is a cool new way that we can generate all kinds of different waveforms and build upon the oscillator techniques that we already have. Lookup tables let us use any waveform for our oscillators by writing the waveform to an array and playing it back at variable speeds. This technique is very flexible and computationally efficient, which makes it very popular across many different areas of programming. With a lookup table oscillator, there's no need to run relatively expensive computations like trig functions like sine and cosine, or with polynomial functions that could be used to approximate a waveform. Instead, you just have to keep track of the phase of your oscillator and find the value stored in memory that corresponds to that index. Before we get started talking about the technique, though, I want to talk about the difference between two different terms. The terms wavetable and lookup table are often used interchangeably, but I want to talk about my opinion on the difference between them. Wavetable synthesizers like Native Instruments Massive and X for Record Serum, as well as the 80 synthesizer, the PPG Wave, all use waveforms stored in memory like lookup tables, but they also have the ability to change the wave shape between many different possible waveforms. In my opinion, it's this ability to change the waveform continuously or modulate the waveform continuously that makes an oscillator a wavetable as opposed to a lookup table, which is one static waveform that does not change, but can be used to play back an oscillator at different pitches. The term lookup table is commonly used in computer science and electrical engineering for a wide range of subjects beyond music and audio. So that's the terminology that I'll use here. Now that we know what a lookup table is, let's talk about how we can write a waveform to one. If we go to Octave, we can look at an example I've prepared on writing a lookup table oscillator to a file. Just as an example for how lookup table oscillators work, before actually building it on our own in Octave, I'll generate the wavetable for our own unique waveform, write it to an audio file, and load it into Ableton Live to use with the simpler instrument, which is a sampler that can play back any audio sample at different frequencies. The way that simpler works, or any sampler that works by playing back an audio file faster or slower to change its pitch, is very similar to what we're going to be doing with lookup table oscillators. So in this script, save rect sine or rectified sine, we're going to generate a rectified sine wave, which is the same as the sine, except for the negative part will, is going to be flipped over the axis in order to become the positive part. And we'll have to center it around zero again to maintain the same headroom. But this gives sort of a mellow sound with a little bit more overtones. And it's kind of an interesting sound that isn't that common. Let's start our script by clearing all the variables in our workspace. We'll set up our sampling rate to be 48 kilohertz and call that FS. We'll generate our lookup table oscillator with the MIDI note 36, which corresponds to C2 in MIDI. This is the same MIDI to frequency function from the previous video part three. We'll give it a MIDI note and it will give us the corresponding frequency in hertz or cycles per second. By giving our MIDI note 36 to the function MIDI to frequency, we can get the frequency of our lookup table. If we divide 1 by the frequency of our lookup table, we'll get the period of the lookup table in seconds, or how long it takes one cycle of our lookup table. If we multiply that value by fs, we will get the period of our lookup table in samples, which we can call lookup table length. This is just going to be the number of samples in our array. Finally, we can generate the lookup table, but through some operations on a sine wave. We'll start with a sine wave that has phase varying between zero and two pi, and we'll use lin space in order to give us LUT length number of samples evenly spaced between zero and two pi. This gives us a regular sine wave. If we take the absolute value of that, we will get a rectified sine wave that varies between zero and one. If we multiply this by two, we'll get a rectified sine wave that varies between zero and two. And if we subtract one, we will get a rectified sine wave that varies between minus one and one. By varying between minus one and one, we make sure that we retain all of the headroom of our file with no DC offset. Let's write this to the file rect sine.wave. We'll give it our array LUT and the sampling rate FS. Let's run this. Pull the file up in our file explorer finder, drag it into Ableton, put it in a MIDI track so that it becomes an instance of simpler. For those of you who aren't familiar with Ableton, simpler is a very basic sampler as the name might imply, and we can use it to play back this sample over various notes. Since it's already tuned to the note C, we know that it's in tune and we can play it across the keyboard. If I pull up the virtual keyboard, we can play some notes with this sample. 
As you can tell, since it's not looping the sample, it just plays the one cycle and stops. Let's loop this so that we can start playing some tones. Already we have sort of a decent bass sound. Let's increase the attack a little bit so it's not so clicky. Play a little bass line. This sort of variable pitch playback is what we want to build in our lookup table oscillator. Before we implement the lookup table oscillator in Octave, we need to talk a little bit about the mathematics of how to calculate the phase. Like I said before, the beauty of a lookup table is you only have to calculate the waveform one time and then just consult the corresponding array at whatever phase you want over time to get the different frequencies. The first thing that we'll want to do is generate sample indices that correspond for the length of the note that we want. We can do this with the octave colon operator, which if you'll remember, generates a sequence of integers between a starting value and an ending value. Let's start with the expression 1 colon n. This will give us the integers between 1 and whatever we set to be n, which we can say is the length of our note in samples. Likewise, this expression will give us an array with n elements in terms of the unit's samples. If we take this expression and divide by fs, our sampling rate, in terms of samples per seconds, we will get an n element array that tells us the time in seconds that correspond to each of these sample indices. We could use this expression in order to index a periodic function at 1 hertz, but since we want to be able to play any different note, we'll have to introduce a term that corresponds to the frequency that we want. Let's add the frequency into this expression. There are no units for this expression since the seconds cancel out and we are indexing a periodic function that we have not defined yet. If we want to use this expression to give us the indices that correspond to our lookup table at the given frequency, we should add the lookup table length as a factor. The units of this expression now become the, our table indices. If we want our lookup table indexing to be periodic, we should use the modulus function. The modulus takes any input argument and wraps it around another input argument. So for example, if our lookup table is 1024 elements long, using this modulus expression will cause the value 1025 to wrap back around to the value 1. To finish this expression up, since the result will be a fractional number, we'll need to round to the nearest sample, since our array only has integer indices. Another very common strategy is to interpolate linearly between the sample before and after the current fractional value, which gives a little bit more accuracy. If we have a sufficiently simple waveform and a sufficient resolution in our lookup table, just using the closest integer sample should be fine as well. Now that we know how to calculate the phase of our lookup table, let's build this in Octave. Here I have an Octave script that implements the lookup table to play various frequency notes with our rectified sign and plays a little melody from Bruno Mars' That's What I Like, which is a pop song that I like. This script uses the framework that we established in the previous video, part three, in order to play a MIDI sequence. Let's start our script by clearing all the variables. We'll set our tempo to 130 beats per minute. Set our sampling rate to 48 kilohertz. Let's set the amplitude of our melody to be 0.2 so that it doesn't get too loud. We'll set our lookup table length to 1024, as we did before. I should say that it's common to use lookup tables that are lengths that are powers of two, so that FFT algorithms can be run on them. Uh, for our purposes, really any length could be used since we're not running FFTs or anything else. But let's go ahead and use 1024 since it's a good practice. Here I have the beats and the notes corresponding to the pre-chorus of That's What I Like from Bruno Mars programmed in here. Let's initialize the array for our melody to be empty. And here we have the same MIDI to frequency function that we used earlier and from part three, as well as a slightly modified beats to sample function. This is similar to one we used in part three, but we're going to give the number of quarter notes or beats for a given note and return the number of samples that correspond to that at the given beats per minute, the given tempo, and the given sampling rate. Let's generate our rectified sign lookup table. And we'll define a new function, get sample from lookup table, that implements the phase equation that we talked about before. Now in combination with the expression later, which converts the sample vector divided by the sampling rate 
to get us time in seconds, multiplied by the frequency, we'll get the argument i, which is the current sample at the current frequency in terms of seconds. If we multiply this by the lookup table, we can get a fractional index into our table. If we round this, we will get the nearest integer to each value. Calculating the modulus of this with the lookup table length is going to make our values range between 0 and 1023. And if we add 1, our values will range between 1 and 1024, which is exactly what we need for an octave array. We will index our lookup table at this calculated phase and return that result. The rest of this should look very familiar from part three. We iterate through every note and melody beats, get the corresponding frequency with MIDI to frequency, get the corresponding length in samples with beats to samples, get the melody tone, which should be the amplitude of our melody, times get sample from lookup table at our current frequency, length, and sampling rate, and append the current tone to the array. At the end of that, let's write this to a file called that's what I like wave using the array melody and the sampling rate fs. Let's run this, pull up the result in our file explorer. There we go, that's Bruno Mars. This technique using our lookup table will work pretty well for a range of different waveforms. However, for waveforms that have a lot of overtones, when we play them at higher frequencies, we're going to get more aliasing. Our waveform now probably has a little bit of aliasing, but since the overtones aren't that strong, or the waveform isn't that bright sounding, it doesn't become that much of an audible artifact. In order to show what this aliasing sounds like, let's modify our octave script so that we get some extreme aliasing. First of all, let's turn down our amplitude to 0.1 because this is going to get a little noisy. Let's change our lookup table to just be a saw wave, which is going to have more overtones than the rectified sine we have been using. You can do that with the lens space function. Vary between negative 1 and 1 with the length LUT length. To make sure that we're playing high enough notes, let's add three octaves or 36 MIDI notes to our MIDI sequence. Let's save this and run it. Pull it up in the File Explorer. So pretty clearly there's some weird sounds going on with that. I'll go over the theory behind this a little bit more in the next video, but basically what's happening is our saw wave has too many high frequency overtones that we can't represent well at this sampling rate. These higher overtones or harmonics in our waveform can be thought of as wrapping around the Nyquist frequency or half our sampling rate and then becoming lower frequency artifacts that are not harmonic multiples of our sound, making a very noisy, unpleasant distortion. In fact, for the product page on Serum from X for Records, they talk about how they went through a lot of trouble to create ultra clean oscillators. They say without considerable care and a whole lot of number crunching, wavetable oscillators will create audible artifacts. As we've seen, we spent basically no effort preventing these audible artifacts, and as you can tell, there are plenty of noisy sounds that come out of the lookup tables. To wrap up, today we talked about lookup tables that can generate any waveform. We talked about generating various frequencies of that waveform by changing the rate that we look through the table, and we showed an example of this working well with relatively low notes using a rectified sine wave, and we showed it working not so well with a high frequency saw wave that generated a lot of aliasing. For more information on this technique, check out the link in the description to Ear Level Engineering, where they talk about designing a wavetable oscillator implementation with many practical considerations. Also, if you're interested in making plugins in C++, head over to the Audio Programmer channel to check out his videos on implementing some of these same algorithms. For example, Juice Tutorial 11, Basic Wavetable Synthesis in Juice, talks about sort of the nuts and bolts of implementing this concept in C++. In my next video, I'll talk a little bit about aliasing that we came across and how to avoid it, and sort of the theory behind it as relates to additive synthesis and the Fourier series. Thanks for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Leave comments if you have any questions or any responses to anything in this video. Give it a like if you enjoyed it, and subscribe if you're interested in more content like this. See you next time.